、秋風にたなびく雲の絶え間より、漏れいずる月の影のさやけさ。From a gap in the clouds stretched thin by autumn wind, the moon radiates its brilliance. Good evening, early evening, late afternoon, good morning, whatever part of the world or the house you're finding yourself in at the moment.、Um, you're very welcome to this virtual launch of A Gap in the Clouds,、um, a new translation of the Ogura Hayakunin issue by. James Hadley and Nell Regan.、Uh, my name is Pat Boren. I'm from the、uh, micro publisher,、um, the Daedalus Press, which、um, generally publishes what we think is the best or some of the best of contemporary poetry from Ireland. But we have a particularly strong interest in、um, international poetry and poetry, specifically poetry in translation.、Um, the press was named after. Joyce's alter ego, Stephen Dedalus. So one can imagine that、um, an outward glance occasionally is very much、um, part of the complete view of the world.、Um, when I said that this was a virtual launch, in a sense, it's not. It's a launch that we're bringing to you virtually, but there's nothing virtual about it. It's as real as anything else that happens in what passes for the world these days. And、um, we're really pleased that so many of you have. Found the time、um, to join us from wherever you are for this conversation, which I think is really what it will be,、um, illustrated, if you like, by、uh, a few of the poems,、um, but really an,、uh, a conversation and an encounter between the two translators.、Um, and I'll say just biog notes, if you like, about the, the,、uh, the two translators before I introduce them and we.、Uh, We follow, in a sense, the,、uh, the trail of breadcrumbs into this very interesting anthology,、um, following a sequence of the poems. So,、uh, first of all, James Hadley is、uh, Usher Assistant Professor in Literary Translation at Trinity College and Director of the College's Master's Degree in Literary Translation. He studied Japanese and computing at undergraduate level and Buddhism and translation studies. At master level,、um, completing a PhD in translation studies in 2013. His,、um, his abiding、uh, interests, perhaps I'm going to push it further, why not? That's my job.、Uh, one of his obsessions, I'm going to say, is、um, the whole idea, the whole、um, overlap between computer based tools and translation, and how one might enable, or affect, or direct, or redirect, or Otherwise,、um, re channel the other.、Uh, Nell Regan, meanwhile, is a poet, non fiction writer based in Dublin. She's published three previous collections of poems, most recently, One Still Thing from Enneth Harmon Press in 2014. She's won、uh, or received awards from the Arts Council Literature Bursary, a fellowship of the International Writing Programme, prestigious writing programme at Iowa. And she's been a Fulbright Scholar at Berkeley, as well as the recipient of the Patrick and Catherine Cavanagh Fellowship. Her biography, Helen Maloney,、uh, Helena Maloney, A Radical Life, was published by Arlen House in 2017 and was an Irish Independent Book of the Year that year. And she's also translated、uh, the Irish language poems of Michal MacLeamore, which have appeared in a number of journals. She works as a freelance. Uh, writer and educator and literary program. And I suppose、um, we're looking, in a sense, at two people from parallel, but in, in, in most daily activities from two different worlds.、Um, certainly, the, the, the theory of translation would be closer, and the knotty theory of translation would be closer, one might imagine, to. The preoccupations that James faces on a daily basis. So, I suppose the first and obvious question is what brought these two people together? What brought James and Nell together? Was it that they decided, let's find something to work on? Or was it perhaps that this particular book was crying out
for a new translation and it brought these two people from their respective literary perches. So I don't know who wants to answer first, but I'd welcome James and Nell to the arena, as it were, and, uh, and throw it open to either or both of you. I'll, I've unmuted, so I'll, I'll go for it. Thanks, Pat. Thank you for that introduction. Um, no, it's a lovely kind of, I suppose, happen chance, re really, and um, happenstance even, um, and actually comes about, uh, the book is dedicated to one Sarah Smith, who was the founding director of the Trinity Centre for Literary Translation, and actually we have Sarah to thank, because um, you mentioned the MacLeamore poems, well, back in about four years ago, I was, um, I just moved into a one bed and I was translating the MacLeamore and I was chatting to Sarah and she was saying that she had, there was actually space at that stage in the centre if I wanted to use a desk. So as we all know, working from home is, uh, <laughs> the whole world is now working from, <laughs> from their bedrooms. But at the time it was brilliant to, to have that opportunity. And so I was interested in translation. I was translating from Irish, which I, I knew. And then myself and James were chatting a lot and I would again have an interest in Japanese poetry that would have been very influential for my kind of own work um, and yeah I suppose we started doing one or two poems and then um, started speaking about a larger project and really it was I might hand over to James because it was really him who um, kind of picked the book as it were but I suppose one of the things that attracted both of us to it was the fact that I think about a third of the book is um, our female poets do you know what I mean that's a very strong mm. element in the book um, as well. But James, I might hand over to you if you like. And I think you painted a wonderful picture there. Um, yeah, it's 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 true. We were we were talking for a long time before we actually started actively translating things. And then um, we were actually invited to translate a handful, very small handful of poems for another work, which were uh, also Tanka. So the poems in this book are, are Tanka. And um, uh, those poems were um, from World War II, so much, much, much later. And then we kind of got a taste for the, the, the idea of translating together and translating especially short poems. So um, we took it from there, really. And I'd, I'd known about this uh, collection for many, many years because it is the most famous collection of poems in, in Japan, I think, bar none. And um, the, there were a few of the poems inside that I really liked anyway. And so I, uh, I think I might have read one or two of them to uh, Nell and then the rest is history, as they say. And no, uh, so let sorry. sorry, Nell. No, I was just going to say what's so lovely about the, the book is that it's um, kind of, for me, finding out about it is the fact that it's used as a kind of game of cards in Japan. Like it's actually so famous that people play this at New Year's in their homes and at tournament level. So it's just, I mean, I kind of picture Panger Bond being played as a game of snap. Do you know what I mean? That's actually the, kind of the nearest equivalent. Um, so it's, it's very much part of Japanese popular culture, as well as being a kind of historic um, anthology. I think there are lots of us rediscovering card games and Ludo and Lego and all sorts of um, simple pleasures, I think you could say at the moment. Um, but I, I wonder about the world that this book came from. You know, you mentioned Nell and 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 James recognised that, that that was one of the attractions. The fact that so many of the writers here are female that is a version of the world we don't always easily see when we look at canonical literature. Let's put it that way, uh, and and not not to get too distracted by it. But so I wonder. What is the society, if you like, that produced this work? That's one question. And the other question is, in what sense is it a, a defined work? In what sense is it a book rather than an anthology in the Greek sense, a gathering of, of flowers from various places? Um, we know, or, or we might know, that this is a collection of uh, 100 poems by 100 poets. Is it, is it that? Is it... Um, a snapshot in time or are these people are these poets and these poems connected to each other in a organic way it's really it's a fascinating collection because it is it does spread over about 400 years but there was definitely a mind behind the putting together of it as it were but one of the things that's fascinating is you look at the biogs of all the poets they're all interrelated because they come from this very kind of elite um courtly world of japan and um you know, where poetry was kind of, could make or break your reputation and was really important. And I think to compile an anthology for an emperor was seen as a, a thing of prestige. 
So a lot of the anthologies were actually compiled for emperors. But what I love is that um, kind of the poets are all related in some way. Like one poet might be the lover of another poet or the grandfather of another poet. And sometimes both, we just say. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. But more more really of this and on, I promise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Game of Thrones has nothing on this book, I tell you. Um, yeah. But they're, they're, you know, and particularly the kind of the, the female poets were all gathered around um, the Empress Soshi. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so you had um, women like the, the authors of the classic tale of Genji, which is actually seen as the world's first novel, and other poets like Ono no Komochi. But again, they were in these very small kind of courtly, um, courtly circles. But James, I know, I mean, you might want to say something about how the book, the anthology was put together itself yeah so it was um it was quite common to make anthologies at the time uh, of poems because as Nell said the the world of poetry really was um so um important for medieval the elites in medieval Japanese um culture so um it wasn't particularly unusual to make um collections of them especially considering that they're so short but um in this case, we know that the, the collection was made uh, effectively to decorate someone's house. Um, so someone was having, a, 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 I guess, a residence built in a place called Ogura, which is why it's called the Ogura collection. And um, on the, the screens that separate the rooms and that decorate the rooms, uh, wanted to have poems. So these are the poems that we use to decorate those screens. So, um, yeah, so uh, it wasn't actually written down in a book in the first place. It was actually uh, uh, used as, as a decorative um, feature of someone's residence. And was there, because when you, when, you, when you mentioned that they were made for a residence like that, then is there something more, how would you say, more intimate, more private about them because you know, now if one writes, I think if any of us in any discipline, if we write, one of the hopes is publication in that sense, broadcast. But these seem to be closer to art objects. There's one of them and they're made for one. They're site specific, I think you might, you might oh, say. That's interesting. Um, no, I think they would have been, there would have been circulation of the poems and they would have been kind of poetry circles and they would have been reading them to each other. So I suppose their kind of Twitter or their broadcast was was within mm. their own world and fierce kind of poetry debates going on about um, aesthetics and, you know, formalism and really like extraordinary to see that happening kind of over a thousand years ago. But um, I think that the, uh, yeah, so it was just another form of presenting them. Do you know what I mean? Like those poems would have been very well known. Um, kind of, for example, like some of them, the early ones would have been um, site, there's one, I think the opening poem is actually normally seen as a, um, an anonymous one, whereas it's kind of dedicated, it's attributed to Emperor Tenji in this collection. So there would have been a bit of that going on as well, the poems that would have been classic would have um, uh, been very known and some somebody would have attributed them to somebody else, that kind of thing, if that makes sense. So the world of the cover version, I think, has been with us for a long time. Yeah. Um, let's, let's, see, let's hear one of the, one of the poems. They're, they're very short. And I, I, as I was saying to you before, the audience started to take their places on the sofa, like members of the Simpsons family, um, that if you feel the, the urge, you can read a poem twice, or you can refer back to it while we're talking about it. Because if, unless you're like us and you have the poems, in front of you, they, they fly by pretty quickly, let's put it like that. Um, but this first one, Nell, you were saying has some of the flavor of the that court world we're talking about. Yeah, I think the poem, um, maybe James, we could do, we could um, have a look That's at- That's the one on page 61, sorry. We're oh, not 61, going to take sorry. them necessarily yeah, in, yeah. in sequence. So yeah, I'm not yeah, trying yeah. to catch it by surprise. Brilliant. No, that's perfect. Um, this is gorgeous because it refers to, it again shows you the passage of time among the, the generations of poets within the book because Nara would have been the, the kind of where the, the center of power was. And at, probably when this collection was, the poems in the collection began, I think, so this poet near the end of the collection is actually going to Nara and viewing the cherry blossoms, but it's that notion of something still being there. But I think, you know, what it really does is it, it shows, when we were translating, um, a lot of the poems have two or maybe three meanings. 
based around pivot words, the cut, cut I can never say this properly, cut but I'll get James to say it properly. Um, and they, um, this one in particular one was referring both to the cherry blossoms, but also to the rooms within the palace going in and in and in. So again, you know, one of the really delicious challenges of translating this was how do you get those two meanings across in English when we mightn't have the same cultural reference points. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the, the very much the when somebody mentions the ancient palace of Nara, you know they're talking about the court and they're talking about this, this society of, of courtly writers that they're talking about. Um, so I don't know, James, should we show do that poem? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll come back to that uh, that illusion between or that that link between the the palace and the and the cherry blossom because it is important. This one, just a second. Inishie no nara no miyako no yae sakura hyo koko no e ni nioi nuru kana. I view cherry blossoms in the ancient palace of Nara, exquisite. Each double layer reveals another inner sanctum. One suspects that that phrase inner sanctum there is loaded with all sorts of meaning and mystery, James. Exactly, yes. So uh, in the Japanese version, uh, there's this interesting uh, playoff in the poem because it's talking about the uh, eight layered uh, cherry blossoms, which is how you refer to a double bloom in Japanese. If, you, if it's, a, if it's a, a double flower, they call it an eight layer flower. And in this case, it's an eight flowered cherry blossom. But um, the the ancient palace is referred to as the nine layers. Uh, so you're using the same word effectively to describe uh, the cherry blossom and the, the palace, even though the numbers themselves are different. So there are more layers to the palace than the, there are to the cherry blossom. But the, there's this link between the two. And I guess it's trying to say that they're both as complex and as or, ornate as each other. That's one of the things, I mean, um, Nell mentioned there the delicious, I think was the word she used, challenge. There's something about taking on translation at any stage that, that, that it is a challenge, it's a problem to be solved and one ends up with some kind of approximation, not to go off onto a, 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 you know, into the world of theory, but, but is there a temptation to footnote the work afterwards? Because while you're, while you're saving some babies, you're losing others, as it were, you know, you're losing some darlings. Um, no, and it, it, it was fascinating, this book, how to do that, because I think there are so many cultural references. And actually, you've got to, I mean, we had a wonderful process, particularly, Pat, with yourself, do you know, of kind of several of the words just had to go because they didn't hmm. mean enough for an English audience. And they actually kind of, they, they actually diluted the poem and the power of the poem and the image. So I think that, um, but I, Funny, I was thinking about it after and I was thinking there's a wonderful, um, oh God, I can't, there was a musician I heard recently on a documentary and he was saying, I'd rather have the rhythm than the note. And I think that's almost it. It's like you're trying to capture the essence of a poem in another language. And you, yes, you may, in one poem, you may have to sacrifice some of the sound or some of the meaning or some of the illusions. But what you're hoping to do um, is to actually create a new poem in the new language that has, um, that's drawn from, from the original. And, um, you know, again, because these had so many double meanings, which in the, the original are so simple. I mean, you've seen the kind of, um, the kanji. And one of the, the things that we had to do was, um, I actually asked James to do me out a kind of template with under or under each of the characters to do the exact words. So I could see just how finely these poems were constructed because I suppose that's one of the tricky things. I don't have Japanese, so I'm, do you know mm. what I mean? It, it's, it's a real challenge to get inside a poem and get inside the language um, in order to hopefully kind of create something beautiful um, in English. Yeah, but that, that idea that there are, you know, there are 
conventions and restrictions and limitations in the original language. There are also in the translations and even in the process of translation. Um, you know, for instance, there's a, a, an established form, if not a tradition now, uh, at least in English, that if one is translating waka or tanka, that one does it in a five line form. But the original, as we discussed in a previous conversation, is essentially a kind of a one utterance. It's a one gesture. It's, a, you know, that five part element in fact, is not really there in the original, though. So it's it's a convention of the receiving language. Um, I, I suppose I wonder, you know, when when one starts to bring the poem from one language to another, how do you know when it has arrived? Is it is it when it feels right in the destination language when it has some kind of authentic flavor? or when it still maintains enough, enough of the uh, foreign, exotic, uh, distant uh, elements that, that possibly attracted the translators in the first instance. That James is laughing because I'm renowned and for bringing, kind of overworking the poems. And actually there's definitely a thing, you do maybe 10 versions and you go back to your eighth version. So I think sometimes, mm. I'm always glad I'm not a painter, because I think as a painter, you kind of over, if you overpaint, it's harder to go back. Or if um, you're a sculptor, it's not easy either. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas I think, um, I do, yeah, I mean, we had a lovely process because we'd meet initially and James would do the work kind of trying to do it, give him a kind of transliteration, I suppose. And then mm. come back with the poem and he might say, no, that's not quite it. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're kind of, you've gone off in a slightly wrong direction. and then sometimes I wouldn't be satisfied with it. So I'd go off and play with it again. And so it was lovely. There was a lot of kind of toing and froing and then kind of working with yourself as editor as well. So I suppose it, um, it's when you can sound the note in English, isn't it? It's like when it sings a bit in English. Mm. And I think the other thing we tried to do, there's this incredibly intricate vowel music in all of the poems and you couldn't replicate it in English because it would just sound ridiculous. But what I tried to do is kind of maybe echo some of it do you know what I mean? So, um, mm. James, I don't know, is there anything? Um... Well, I, I would like to go back to something that you said a little while ago about footnoting, because there's this, like, yeah. uh, to overestimate how strong the pull is to footnote these <laughs> poems to death, because there's just so much, so many layers of interpretation and meaning and difference in cultures. But luckily, thanks to that, this process, I was able to scratch that itch because I could, I could footnote all day long and then give all those all that information to Nell, and then she could turn it into poetry, which was or inform the poetry that she was uh, producing. So um, yes, there was a strong pull to, to doing that, but it was part of that process, and we ended up. I think it's amazing how much um, is actually included here uh, without, without, yeah, footnoting them. Uh, I'm just thinking where, where Nell mentioned a moment ago there, James, um, the vowel music and, you know, that sense of, I think in the end you decide with your ear as much as anything else that, that something feels right, it feels at home. Um, but, but you mentioned to me before in, 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 in a chat that one of the, one of the trans, one of the challenges and one of the textures, if you like, of the original is that, the Japanese language makes such great use of homophones. And, and could you talk to me a little bit about that, about you know, how, how it works and how you, how you uh, solved or resolved those problems in, in a language that, that really doesn't make such great use of them, let's say? Yeah, um, so um, Japanese and especially this kind of classical Japanese um, is very, um, limited when it comes to the number of vowel sounds and, and consonant sounds that there are. Um, so, or partly because of, the, of that reason, for that reason, we end up with lots of homophones. So that means words that sound the same, but are different. So you can end up quite in quite a, a lot of the poems. In fact, probably most of the poems, you end up with these double meanings. And that was the kakikotoba that uh, Nell was mentioning before, which are the effectively the words that the, the poem pivots on 
So that's that's where the if you have multiple layers of meaning, that's where your interpretation of the poem really comes out. And um, so in some of the cases, there's, there's a couple of the cases where the poem could be read in two completely different ways and both of them are correct. Um, and uh, another interesting thing is that when you write them out in Japanese, you have the choice either to pin down one of these meanings if you choose um, to write them out using specific kanji, or you can leave the ambiguity fairly open if you choose to write them out using one of the uh, syllabic writing systems. So um, yeah, if you want to be vague, Japanese is a good language to, to write in. <laughs> Um, and 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 apart from apart from the the, the dangers of vagueness, um, there's there's also other attractions. Let's say to to um, the homophone, in, in that one can have a presence in two meanings simultaneously. Um, a, a number of these poems. I'm thinking, for instance, of the next poem on our list, which is on page sixty-two. For those of you who are following. Uh, elsewhere. I think we're going to see the poem anyway now in, in a moment. But um, I hinted earlier that some of the poems were made uh, or seem to be made for an intimate kind of audience or certainly about intimate subject matter. And, uh, and that idea of multiple meanings, double meaning, double entendre is, is certainly part of this next poem, James, isn't it? So that ruse might have worked in the classics, but crowing like a cock as night wraps up won't open these gates for you. Um, that yeah, no, that's one of definitely one of the double entendre poems. Um, and it, what was really tricky about that one was that actually referenced like anyone reading it in Japan would know immediately that it's referencing a really classic Chinese story about a fleeing army, and the army flee by um, imitating the sound of a cock crow, and they they are allowed then out of the territory because the door, the gatekeeper opens the gate thinking that it's morning time. Um, so again, how you kind of how do you translate that into English without sort of getting so overcomplicated about the classic Chinese um, uh, tale? But then the other thing that it mentions Osaka Gate and the, the original, and Osaka Gate was a very famous gate, but it also happened to be a an allusion to lovers sleeping together. Do you know what I mean? So you've got these two, several layers of things going on, um, and. Uh, I mean, I suppose one of the things that we kind of made a decision about early on was that um, apart from all those layers going on is that Japanese doesn't have any pronouns. So you're never sure who's, there's no indication in the poems if somebody, if he is saying it to she, if she is saying something to he, if, you know, somebody's talking to third person. <laughs> so I think that that was one of our early decisions to kind of, to make these poems really immediate and to make them kind of sing in a way and, and speak to the contemporary reader was to use the direct address as much as possible, Do you know. So that in this version, the um, the poet is addressing the the speak the the listener, as it were. Um, and you know, there's another terrific one. Um, I can't remember which number it is actually, but it's uh, oh, it's poem thirteen, and it's one about a river falling into a a waterfall. And you know, again, as James was saying, one reading of it is very nice. You know, river falling into a waterfall, but the site is actually the place name mentioned is actually one where a very famous fertility rite takes place. And so, basically, there's kind of this mass lovemaking taking place outdoors. So again, you're trying to get the nuances of of both those those things, and without overdoing it either. Hopefully, which more than anyway. Just I think it's it's difficult enough to do even in in. Um one's own language to put it like that um and uh, and, and many of us have had a good chuckle over the years at the you know things like the literary reviews um terrible sex writing awards you know which i think morrissey my my former hero as a teenager won at at least one occasion um but but to try to catch that 
uh, ambiguity, that nuance, that playfulness, you know, and if you're doing it with without pronouns, it's it, it's like trying to keep an eye on the action when all the lights are off in the bedroom. So there, there's 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 quite a lot of that a lot that could go wrong. Put it like that. Uh, but I, maybe we leave it we leave it there. We leave the rest to the imaginations. Um, we're going in a way from the uh, from the ridiculous to the sublime um, with the next poem. Uh, just following the list of poems because. Um, if the if the previous poem in in a sense hints to those uh to, to that aspect of the of the anthology that is about uh, intimacy uh, about you know shared experience about fun about you know those those uh maybe more enjoyable elements of the of the human experience um the next section uh, the next poem, if you like, seems to speak to our moment uh, almost directly. And I think, you know, when you when you approach translation like that, you're looking, as I said earlier, you're looking for something that's uh, strange and to some extent exotic, something that you can travel towards. But but what really connects with you is what seems to speak with your own voice or your inner voice. And that's very much there in this poem um, on page 70. Uh, maybe we could maybe we could hear see and hear that first in these lovely um, powerpoints that uh, that James has been so so good as to uh, as to um, uh, assemble for for this uh, event. Maybe we'd 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 see and hear poem seventy. Sabishani yado tachi dete nagamureba izuko mo onaji. I leave my bleak cell to gaze about, no point. Autumn twilight is lonely everywhere. And exactly that, I mean, I think what was extraordinary about finishing this book during the first lockdown was just how the sensibility of the book really kind of came into sharp focus, that sensibility of, well, so many of them were written from isolation or a place of loneliness. And so many of them were about paying close attention to the natural world. And it just seemed to really speak to speak to this year and the kind of, you know, so extraordinary that these poems that were written kind of by these kind of emperors and ladies in waiting, you know, a thousand, thousand, two hundred years ago would speak to us now. And I think that was, you know, we'd kind of felt that as we were translating them. But I think when the pandemic happened, I think it was really very it really underlined that actually and 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 the kind of sustenance of poetry i mean somebody who very kindly texted me recently they'd got the book and they said it's like getting a daily vitamin pill and i just thought wow what a kind of what a compliment actually do you know i really appreciated that because i think the, the gem of each poem is 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 um they are like a little shot <laughs> um there's something about the the solitary things solitary yeah of the many of the poems or the poets as well um which we found out part way through doing the the translations part of the research was that um especially the female poets were not even though they were the super elite of the country like a tiny percentage of the the country's total population they really didn't have much in the way of freedom physical freedom mm -hmm. So they were very often um, writing poetry because they had not much else to do. So if they if they were not visited, then they didn't see anyone for a day, essentially. And if the rain is awful or if, if they can't get out for some reason, then they don't go out because especially the female poets, really, they had to have an entourage. It was a big event for them to go out of wherever they lived. So um, although the pandemic was probably not anything like that um, in the sense that we can probably go out without entourages and probably should, um, it still kind of rang true that we, even if we would like to go out, we can't really. Uh, James, I wonder there when you're talking about, you know, the. In a sense, the status of of the the poets, uh, 
Um, did poetry confer a status on these members at various levels in the court? Did it, did it give some extra uh, public meaning? Uh, you know, one, one tends to turn to poetry, I think, in moments of emotional change or crisis or existential, but, but, you know, um, but, but the effect of it can be different than the purpose. Uh, 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 so I wonder, did it did it change things for people? Did it raise their their stocks and shares in that sense? Absolutely, it was one of the ways that people um, communicated. Um, so yes, if you if you were known for writing a bad poem, then it could um, it could seriously damage your your your. <laughs> And likewise, the other way around as well, if you were known for being able to compose poems, and especially ones where uh, you came across as being fairly um, weak, that was seen as something that was attractive to, to this particular group of the super elite. So instead of um, emphasizing your, your macho-ness or your power, emphasizing your, your weaknesses was something that was seen as, as um, appealing during that time. That, that's where I've been getting it wrong all these years. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Um, okay, very, we, we've, we've, nearly come, um, we've nearly come to the end of our, your um, uh, exchange or discussion of the poems, and uh, we, we're going to hear another poem, um, but we might also invite questions from the, the various floors uh, if if people feel like doing that, I think uh, Ethna Bowen, who is our operations manager and who knows this system um, much better than I do, um, might be able to uh, pass on any questions like that. If there are any, I think people uh, can can um, can they type them in there? Is that the way it works? Yeah, uh, James is nodding. Um, but in in the meantime. We might uh, we might continue if some, there's no pressure on anybody to do that. It would be nice, but as I say, there's no pressure. We might um, we might continue on. I just I just wonder, um, you know, we mentioned earlier on about the how the two of you came to work on this book, um, you know, how you came to come together, if you like, and then this book. But I suppose one of the things I wonder is if uh, an anthology of poems is, is around as long as this is. I mean, the first of them were met the others, if you like, uh, what, 800 years ago. The, the, the anthology wasn't exactly formed then, but, but that's where its genesis is. Um, there have been other versions of it. And, and, and in some senses, um, you know, it's preserved in amber in some ways because it's an historical document. So that's one difficulty when when you when you approach it to make something new and then as i said that the other difficulty is that um others have come before you and had a go at it uh so so i wonder is it the the, the kind of the mount everest of japanese poetry does one at some stage have to have a climb <laughs> you know have to go up mount fuji in the snow or or, or what is it about these particular poems um, I, you know, you could have gone the road less travelled, so to speak. I had, um, no. I actually met at a party in England. I met up with um, the the son of a cousin of mine, and he's doing an MA in Japanese translation. And when I told him what he was doing, he just looked horrified. He's going, you can't, you can't. He said, "Have you ever Jap translated Japanese poem?" I said, "No." And he said, "You can't start there." And I was going, "Okay." And then he heard who I was translating with, and he said, "Oh no, you'll be fine." James is, you know, he knows knows his stuff, but. I think I think it was a question of not knowing for me what I was mm. stepping into. <laughs> it, ig ignorance, you know that line for, by Wallace Stevens: "Ignorance is one of the sources of poetry." I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, and it definitely. I think the other thing which we were very kind of strong on was not looking at. Um, I mean, I would have drawn a lot from Jane Hirschfield, who and how she worked, because I think and Kenneth Rexroth, that would have been points of reference for me. Um, poetic points of reference and you know the very famous American translators of Japanese poetry but I think other than that I t we tended to try and really just go back to the words because I think we figured that um, if we 
yeah, if we just focused on the words and focus on what was in front of us, do you know what I mean? That that would see us through because honestly, you could get, well, A, you'd get dazzled if you saw how many versions there are out there, you'd kind of, you know, but also just the level of kind of academic and cultural commentary on them. And mm. um, so I think it was a question, it was a mixture of kind of ignorance on my part. Um, and then also just once we were kind of, a good way into it we just thought okay we'll just focus on what's in front of us you know yeah uh, there's an interesting question here from um, i'll just use first names because then nobody's under scrutiny but uh, from someone called russell uh, who's wondering is there a distinct difference between the poems early in the book and later in the book in other words you know because they're over that long relatively long historical period have i suppose the formal issues to be resolved, have they changed? Have the preoccupations changed? Would one know if one parachuted into the middle of the book? Um, that it, would one know where one is in the in the evolution of it? Could you answer that, James, or or, or, or is it a question that makes sense to you? Um, it does make sense, uh, and you would expect if you if you thought about something like the sonnet and how that might have developed over the exactly several hundred years, you'd expect to see some formal changes. And it's not really, it's not really as obvious as that. So um, we mentioned earlier that you normally translate with five lines, a tanka, and in Japanese, it's not, set, they're not normally separated as distinct lines, but they, there are still five components and that's common throughout. So that's the kind of defining feature. Um, but if you, I mean, if you're very well <laughs> informed, then you can kind of guess the later ones from the earlier ones because of thing, very subtle things like um, locations that are mentioned. So uh, if you're talking about Nara as the capital, then it wasn't capital by the time that the later poems were written. Whereas uh, if you're talking about Mount Fuji, then that would have been kind of outside the realms of the of the, the central elite at the time of the very early uh, earliest poems. So you can kind of tell from hints, but those are not particularly um, reliable either, because sometimes people wrote in kind of retrospect. So um, Nell, do you have some anything to add there? Yeah, I think. I think there was a big shift in the kind of period around after. It's funny, it's slightly sketchy, but I do think there was a big shift in kind of um, in how poems were written and the kind of um, the voice that was used after that. Do you know what I mean? But I think that that period is is quite um, similar in in its stretch, even though they're four hundred years apart. Um, hmm. um, and, and and you know, while we're on the the. The wider exchange uh, about, you know, what makes up the poems or what features uh, one might expect to see in the poems. Alec uh, is asking um, th that there's a sense, uh, or there's, a, a, there's a, an understanding that in Japanese poetry, I think maybe he's thinking of haiku. I'm not sure I'm not an expert at all in this area, but that there's often a key word that erts or exemplifies or thematizes, if that's a word, uh, the poem, the kigo uh, in, in um in, in the haiku, for instance, is there that kind of focus element in these poems? Um, and if there is, you know, that 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 uh, that a kind of a kernel, a focus kernel, a theme, that element in the poems, um, or was that a feature of your your uh, response to them? Or does it? Does, are you following me? Yes. Sorry, Nell. I think I lost. You. I lost sound there for a second. Um, are you with me? Is there is there that connection between the the, the haiku tradition, say for instance, and the tanka? Is is it is it uh, erted in a season, for instance? Are there are there those other conventions that we might not be aware of? You know, the presence of snow in a number of poems, of cherry blossoms in others, etc. Are there other uh, detonators like that? 
Absolutely. So the, the haiku actually developed from the tanka. So the haiku is, is a later development and um, many of the features of the haiku are, are based on the much, much longer tanka tradition. And one of them is these, these season words, these, these words that kind of ground the poem in um, not just something as simple as autumn, winter, spring, or which one did I miss? Uh, <laughs> Um, winter the one that's still carrying on <laughs> yeah but also it will very often be um as a specific month or even a specific time of a month so one of mm. one of the terms that we agonized over many 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 times was this ariake period which is a, a period of a few days when the the sun I forget what it exactly is, but it's when the sun... Waning moon on the 16th of the month. <laughs> <laughs> so it's when the sun is... No, the moon is visible during the daytime, but it's it's waning. So it, yeah. Yeah, so it's incredibly specific mm. time periods. And, and also, that, that, I, that, Sorry, Nell. No, just I suppose what we realised, what was important to carry over in that was it was the notion that... The reason it was so significant was because these kind of aristocratic lovers didn't live together. So it meant that the, that, that particular moon had a particular resonance because they had to part and da da da. So I suppose you're trying to kind of, while you can't carry over the, the quite clunky you know, five line of poetry, the 16th, you know, the waning moon on the 16th. But again, it's, it's, it's just a, a deepening of that longing. Do you know what I mean? Was, was what you were kind of, um, trying to get them mm. what you hope that that would signify. But the, the, um, one of the other ones, which was a real signifier was, um, was a Tatsuto river, which was always um, red from maple leaves. So again, while, you know, we might be more, we are probably quite aware of maple leaves being autumn, cherry blossom, spring. So whereas the name reference to a particular river would indicate kind of autumn, bright red. Um, so again, those kind of things had to be teased out. So even though we said we didn't go into the kind of the references, I think we went into the physicality of them, maybe more would be a good way of putting it. Like what exactly did they mean by the that waning moon or by the kind of sea burning seaweed salt? Do you know what exactly with, was going on in the poem rather than what did somebody say about what went on in the poem, if that makes sense? Mm. We've touched on there a number of the... Um, of the core themes, I mean, the themes of all poetry from all times and places, to, you know, human beings tend to come back to the same things, love, loss, longing, the natural world. Um, are, are there other elements here that make these poems particularly, if one can say that, particularly Japanese and an interesting associated, if you like, a, co a connected question from, from Maya, who's wondering, uh, how do you account for the extraordinary refinement and power of Japanese, traditional Japanese poetry. What's that, what's the, where's that power come from? Does it come from a, 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 a society looking in on itself or a society that somehow knows how to treasure previous achievement and build on it or what is it? I wonder if some of it is the, the kind of spirit, the essence of it or the spirit of it in this, I don't know. I mean, there's, I, it often strikes me, and I think as a kind of younger poet, I, I was very influenced by Japanese poetry because it taught me how to look, how to see. And I think it's a very intense, you know, while a lot of them are about emotions or about personal life, it's very kind of, um, it's, they're a lesson in looking out and looking deeply out. And I think, you know, maybe at the time that these poems were written, the Shinto religion would have been the kind of primary um, religion and that notion that gods are in every living thing so everything is precious do you know what I mean around you now I don't know if that quite answers your Maya's question um but I think I also think the kind of the scale and the beauty and the the sheer um yeah is maybe what's made them made them last but James I don't know maybe you've a, a thought on that as well it's very difficult to tease out actually because um, the one thing that, well, not the one thing, but the thing that really hits me whenever I look back at these poems is, is that they, they are a snapshot. So you're trying to 
um, kind of characterize on an emotional level and also on um, often a visual level, some kind of mental photograph effectively. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the poems were written quickly. And it, it seems to me really obvious that they were not because <laughs> so refined, like they were so polished and the levels of detail, the, the choice of words is so, um, it's, it's hard to explain how elaborate it is um, because it includes so many of these very, very tiny uh, particle words, which we don't really have in English, but they, they function to add huge layers of meaning. So you might just make one sound like yo, and then suddenly the reader or the listener knows that you feel strongly about what you've just said. So it's like saying, oh, oh, I wonder, or something like this. Whereas, so in English, we have to say this whole phrase, but in Japanese, you can just say one word. And they don't just do this once, they stack them on top of each other. So you would end up with something like, oh, I wonder if I had only thought about something, something, something. And they've said all of this with maybe three words. Whereas in English, yeah, we struggle with the whole thing. So that didn't happen quickly. and. It wasn't by mistake, that's for sure. Uh, and James, just a, a last question, really, I think, um, before we get to the final poem. You, as a, as a student of Japanese for quite a number of years, we'll put it like that, um, how much for you was the, was the sound uh, of, of these poems a, a, an attraction? I mean, you know, with respect to your computer modeling, etc., you know there is something that um, that language can go beyond meaning and appeal to the ear. And I don't know if a, if a computer can respond to it in the same way, um, but it, it can it can touch something that that uh, that connects to the rhythms of the body, the rhythms of the emotions, the rhythms of uh, our feelings, etc. And when the, you know, when you got to the stage of handing all of these possibilities, if you like, to Nell, and then in, in, in the version of it I have in my head, she goes off and plays around and tries this and tries that and comes back to you. Uh, is, the, is, um, is an echo in that sense, a, a literal echo of the original, is that one of the things that would persuade you, it, yes, this version is better than that and guide her and et cetera? How, do, how did that process work? Well, sometimes yes. So if the if um, if a particular person's name is mentioned, or if there's a sound of uh, like the name of a place, um, then the sound is particularly important. And even even when that's not the case, we did discuss. Like I would read the poems to Nell, and then we would discuss the sounds of them. And uh, as often happens in poems from all over the world, you end up with kind of internal, it's not really rhyme, but sound echoes. And so when that happened, I would make sure to, to kind of stress that that's something um, that has happened. But Nell's really the magician when it comes to, to the sound of words. It, it's, uh, it was incredible actually, for someone who doesn't speak Japanese, it was, it was amazing how she would pick up on, um, even when I was not telling her things directly, she would still pick up on, on the sounds that were in the text. I think it's an interesting, and, and possibly in some ways it's an ideal combination that you have somebody who lives very much, or is able to live or has lived in the original language, and then somebody who's coming to it, you know, ignorant in the best possible sense, ignorant and curious. Um, uh, and and uh, great kind of things can occur on that bridge if if uh, both parties are willing to to wade out far enough. Um, we're we're almost at the we're almost at the closing point. I have to say, my, from for myself as the as the publisher of this book, I think you said something very interesting there, James, when you were talking about you know that the the poems don't just happen like that in a moment, but but all good poetry has the feel afterwards, all good art does, as if it's somehow effortless. 
But um, the analogy with photography, to my mind, is one of the attractions of these poems. And for myself, my interest in, in haiku uh, is that sense of to get it through uh, the, 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 the very small aperture and get things in focus. And, and you have to choose very much. So it's a bit of like the, the process of translation in itself. You have to lose things. So it makes what you hold on to have particular power and resonance. Um, I think, you know, for someone like myself who's never been to Japan, when somebody mentions Japan, the first thing I see in my mind is Mount Fuji capped with snow. And we had thought to end with a poem um, which has exactly that image in it. But then we realized that there's a poem that is um, more true in some ways to the moment, uh, the season or the, the overlapping of seasons uh, in which we find ourselves. Um, so we might in a moment end with that poem. Um, but again, I would, you know, speaking as Daedalus Press, I'd like to express my uh, thanks uh, and uh, huge uh, appreciation to Ethna Bowen of, of, the, uh, of, of Trinity, uh, the operations manager there, who's kept all of this uh, running in the background. We hear no wheels turning and there's no smoke coming from the various machines, which is always a good sign. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the, the, the extra work that James did on the slides, etc. cetera. Um, I thank all of you who I can't see, um, but I believe there's quite a number of you uh, for attending tonight, for taking part in this event tonight. Uh, the book is available from deadlesspress.com. That's D-E-D-A-L-U-S press.com. And we're doing our very best from our kitchen table to get it to anybody as fast as we can, wherever you are. Um, uh, so, so thank you again all for uh, taking part, for coming along. Hope to see you at something uh, else again along the road. Uh, to James and to Nell, thanks so much. And we're going to go out with, as they used to say, uh, we're going to go out with poem number 15. <laughs> I go out to the fields to pick spring herbs for you. Snow drifts onto my sleeve. <laughs>